President Grant has set a deadline. After January 1st, 1876, the U.S. Army will treat any Plains Indians not living on reservations as enemy combatants. It's a decision long in the making. Two years ago, an expedition led by George Armstrong Custer discovered gold in the Black Hills. But per the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, those hills belonged exclusively to the Lakota. Regardless, American miners are flooding into the mountains, and the government doesn't have the political will to evict them. For years, Grant tried to buy the Black Hills from the Lakota, but they're not interested in selling. The entire concept to them is absurd. Not only are they sacred, they're also the best hope of feeding themselves independent of government annuities. But a financial crisis in 1873 has made the government broke, and the country needs that gold to restart its economy. So, Custer and the U.S. Cavalry are coming back once more. But this time, Sitting Bull will be there to meet him at the legendary Battle of the Little Bighorn. Thanks so much to Story Learning for helping to support important historical stories. There are a few periods of Sitting Bull's life that get a little obscure, documented only through oral histories and contemporary U.S. government reports, and the years between 1866 and 1874 are definitely one of those periods. But what we do know is that while Sitting Bull was a peripheral figure in Red Cloud's War, these were also the years that his reputation grew as both a leader of great spiritual power and a rallying point for resistance. Sitting Bull's policies of no treaties, no accommodation, and no agreement to live on reservations drew a stark contrast between him and Red Cloud, who as part of the 1868 treaty was trying to adjust to reservation life. But as we've mentioned before, living on a reservation and accepting goods from the agencies wasn't always a binary choice. Some groups actually took an in-between route, deciding they would live on the reservation in winter, when they'd be stationary anyway, and then slip out to follow the buffalo in summer. Others had tried, depending on the agencies, until the federal government missed the promised food deliveries, driving their starving people to hunt out of desperation. Some even found that Sitting Bull had been right when he warned that relying on the government put the Plains tribes at their mercy. When Indian agents didn't like certain behavior or cultural practices, they withheld rations as a form of control. And the young men especially found the reservations constrictive. Plains tribes were often warrior societies, where men achieved rank, status, and masculine pride through feats in hunting or war, but sedentary reservation life meant giving up intertribal combat and buffalo hunts, which was distasteful to young men eager to prove their bravery. Then, of course, there was the government's increasing pressure to sell the Black Hills, or its offer to displace the Sioux Confederation and move them to Indian Territory in what is now Oklahoma. So, all of those people, whether disaffected, starving, or disillusioned, flowed into Sitting Bull's camp, seeking both strength in numbers and his reputation as a holy man. Not only the Lakotas either, but the Cheyennes as well, all in a massive unity camp. One account claims he was the leader of all of the Sioux, but this is plainly false. However, what is true is that Sitting Bull drew an unprecedented following by offering a clearly stated alternative to accepting the reservation system. Namely, that he would refuse to comply with Grant's deadline, continue hunting, and stay as far away from white people as possible. Should the army attack his group, he would fight, and any war would be defensive. But that winter, Sitting Bull's camp swelled even further, this time with refugees. When Grant's deadline passed, the U.S. Army invaded the Powder River and Little Bighorn regions in a three-pronged assault, hoping to sweep up any non-compliant tribes and instigating what would come to be known as the Great Sioux War of 1876. These federal troops were aided by the Crow and Shoshone, hoping to gain back their traditional territories that the Lakota and Cheyenne had captured in the 1850s, then been granted to them in the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. The federals changed tactics as well attacking several non-compliant villages in winter. The survivors poured into Sitting Bull's unity camp, and he ordered his warriors to meet them with gifts of buffalo meat and robes. By this time, the camp had swelled to 10,000 people and 2,500 warriors, possibly the largest gathering of Plains people in history. Still, he needed more. He sent ambassadors out to the reservations, recruiting warriors, and called for a sun dance, a ritual of self-sacrifice to gain a vision from the Great Spirit. So, his adopted brother, who'd taken his father's name Jumping Bear, helped him carry out the offering. A hundred pieces of flesh from his arms, each the size of a pinhead. Then, bleeding, 
With a leather tether pierced through his chest, securing him to the center pole of the lodge, he danced while staring at the sun and breathing through a bone whistle. He continued doing so without food or water for nearly two days. That's when he saw the vision of the blue coats falling upside down like grasshoppers into the camp, and a voice saying, They have no ears. Yes, there would be a great victory over the blue coats, he said upon waking. But in a way, there would actually be two. On June 17th, the Oglala Lakota leader, his horse is crazy, better known as Crazy Horse, ambushed one of the three columns near the Rosebud Creek. But the army's Crow and Shoshone allies spotted the attack and delayed Crazy Horse's advance long enough that he lost the element of surprise. So what might have been a total victory turned into a grinding six-hour battle as Crazy Horse led 1,000 warriors in assault after determined assault against U.S. forces, which fired up to 25,000 rounds of ammunition. This Battle of the Rosebud, or as the Lakota Cheyenne call it, the battle where the girl saved her brother, after a dramatic rescue, effectively stopped the U.S. column's advance. As a result, these troops were not present eight days later when Custer's detachment from the 7th Cavalry came upon the Unity Camp at the river the Lakota called Greasy Grass, and the Americans knew as the Little Bighorn. June 25, 1876, the Unity Camp at Greasy Grass. When he first hears the sound of gunshots, Sitting Bull runs to his tent. As an old man chief, he will not be expected to fight directly, but the camp is full of women and children, and he will need to help evacuate them. While doing so, he sees his nephew White Bull preparing his war medicine. So Sitting Bull picks up his own shield, the one that his father had gave him, and puts it into his nephew's hand. He will need it more. And seeing the young man has an old trade musket, he tells him to drop it and hands him a stone club. This fighting will be close. Crazy Horse is already readying warriors to take on the 700 men that long-haired George Custer has foolishly brought in scattered groups. For the Plains Nations have over 2,000 warriors here. Sitting Bull does not take part in the battle. His part was completed during the Sundance and Gathering of Warriors. Instead, he rallies the women and children and takes them to safety, as on a distant hill, Crazy Horse surrounds, overruns, and crushes Custer's lead contingent. It is an overwhelming victory, like nothing any Indian tribe has achieved in the history of the United States. Five of the 7th Cavalry's 12 companies are wiped out, 286 men, including Custer himself. But Sitting Bull does not feel victory, for the vision had stipulated that they not mutilate, scalp, or steal from the dead, and in the elation, all have happened. The news reaches Washington on July 3rd, just as festivities are spinning up for the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. The victory at Little Bighorn shocks the American government and sours the public on celebration. For while disliked within the army, Custer was a figure of national prominence, a hero of the Civil War, and to have him not only killed but his command destroyed stirs a desire for vengeance. Meanwhile, for a month, the Hunk Papa Lakota feasted and celebrated. But gradually, warriors dropped away, filtering back to the reservations. There, they found army troops ready to disarm all men and withhold food at any hint of rebellion. Cavalry flooded the Powder River country, and Congress forced through an amendment, essentially forcing the Lakota to sell the Black Hills or starve without government assistance. Even Crazy Horse, that most determined warrior, eventually surrendered, only to be bayoneted to death in a struggle following an escape attempt. Yet Sitting Bull still refused to give up. Rather than surrender, he went into exile, crossing the border to Canada, where he would reside for three years. But his story was not over, for when he returned, he would don a war bonnet and take his story east, this time not leading an army, but as the star celebrity in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Wait, what? <laughs> now that's got to be a wild story. And I'm pretty sure you all know by now that we believe the best way to learn just about anything is through great storytelling, which is a philosophy we proudly share with today's sponsor, Story Learning, a wonderful story-based language learning tool. With Story Learning, you learn languages through stories rather than just a bunch of rules. And this helps you put language directly into your brain using the same language learning processes that children use to learn their own native languages. Through Story Learning's narrative-driven approach and interactive follow-up activities, you get to learn a language in context with engaging tales that expose you to authentic use, including idioms, expressions, and cultural nuances that will just get you using your newly learned language faster. Plus, because you are learning through hearing stories, it helps you in 
improve your listening skills, training your ear to understand different accents and develop confidence in your own speaking. And not to tie this back to us again, but we really do know the value a fun and engaging story can have on you remembering a thing. And story learning's approach just gets that too, you know? So if you've been wanting to learn a new language for a while now, or found yourself bouncing off traditional study methods, you should definitely give them a shot. Now, typically, a story learning language course goes for around $300. But for a limited time, if you use our link below, you can take any of the available courses for just $97. Wah! Sugui and Toku! So get started on your language learning adventure here, and after you sign up, why not check out our next video here? Say, did you hear the one about Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Izzy Coin, Ilkner, Dominic Valenciana, Arclight Games, Angelo Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk being legendary patrons? Yeah, turns out they're the best.